It is this absolute and universal inversion and alienation of the actual world and of thought. It is pure culture. What is learnt in this world is that neither the actuality of power and wealth nor their specific notions, good and bad, or the consciousness of good and bad, the noble and the ignoble consciousness, possess truth. On the contrary, all these moments become inverted, one changing into the other, and each is the opposite of itself. The universal power which is the substance when it acquires a spiritual nature of its own through the principle of individuality receives its own self merely as a name, and through it is the actuality of power, is really the powerless being that sacrifices its own self. But this expendable selfless being, or the self that has become a thing, is rather the return of that being into itself. It is a being for self that is explicitly for itself the concrete existence of spirit. The thoughts of these two essences, of good and bad, are similarly inverted in this movement. What is characterized as good is bad, and vice versa. The consciousness of each of these moments, the consciousnesses judged as noble and ignoble, are rather in their truth just as much the reverse of what these characterizations are supposed to be. The noble consciousness is ignoble and repudiated, just as the repudiated consciousness changes around into the nobility which characterizes the most highly developed freedom of self-consciousness. From a formal standpoint, everything is outwardly the reverse of what it is for itself. And again, it is not in truth what it is for itself, but something else that it wants to be. Being for self is rather the loss of itself, and its self-alienation rather the preservation of itself. What we have here then is that all the moments execute a universal justice on one another, each just as much alienates its own self as it forms itself into its opposite and in this way inverts it. True spirit, however, is just this unity of the absolutely separate moments. And indeed, it is just through the free actuality of these selfless extremes that as their middle term it achieves a concrete existence. It exists in the universal talk and destructive judgment which strips of their significance all those moments which are supposed to count as the true being and as actual members of the whole and is equally this nihilistic game which it plays with itself. This judging and talking is, therefore, what is true and invincible, while it overpowers everything. It is solely with this alone that one has truly to do with in this actual world. In this world, the spirit of each part finds expression, or is wittily talked about, and finds said about it what it is. The honest individual takes each moment to be an abiding essentiality, and is the uneducated thoughtlessness of not knowing that it is equally doing the reverse. The disrupted consciousness, however, is consciousness of the perversion, and moreover of the absolute perversion. What prevails in it is the notion, which brings together in a unity the thoughts which, in the honest individual, lie far apart, and its language is therefore clever and witty. With this long paragraph number 521, we're getting close to the end of this, this first section in this culture discussion that, that runs through so much of the spirit section of the work. We're only five more paragraphs after this one is, is finished before we move into the next subsection. And this is one where Hegel is bringing together a number of different thematics that we've run through. And you might say giving us a bit of like something like a summary, but it's going beyond just a summarization of what has taken place. We're now at the point where, where spirit realizes something rather universal about the realm of culture, at least culture as it's gotten to know it so far, Bildung. Uh, and we've had a lot of discussion about exactly what culture comprises. Here, culture is showing itself as involving, as Hegel says, uh, 
an inversion, a verkehrung, and an alienation, an entfremdung, a becoming other, becoming alien to itself. The self, you might say, of the individual who's been trying to figure out where he fits in and what his meaning is, has lost its moorings. Not only has the self done so, but the very categories by which the self was orienting itself turn out to have this same problematic going on, as, as we'll see as we go into this text. So Hegel tells us, in this, it is in this absolute and universal, so no, across the board, right? Total, absolute, and universal inversion and alienation of what? Of the actual world and of thought, he says, it is pure culture. Reine uh, culture, right? Reine Bildung. Um, what is learned in this world, he says, is, and here we get these three different things. So he sums it up first saying, what is learned in this world is neither the actuality of power and wealth, state power that is, right? Neither their, their Wirklichkeit, nor their specific notions, the concepts that we form of them, namely those of the good and the bad, nor the consciousness of good and bad, which he clarifies for us is the noble and ignoble consciousness possess truth. Let's pause for just a moment. What does this mean to say that they don't possess truth? Does this mean that they're all thereby false? Well, false in what sense? Are we talking about truth in the traditional sense of adequation between thought and, and being? or thought and actuality. It turns out, if we follow these dialectical developments, it's not possible to have a static, you know, remaining in place adequation or correspondence of that sort. We would have to have a actuality that's as shifting as thought is, and just as deep and reflective. We would have to have a thought that follows along the developments in the actuality of whatever it is that we're, we're taking here. But that's not actually what Hegel means here by truth. He's talking about something more comprehensive. Remember, truth for Hegel is almost always going to be opposed to certainty, Gewissheit. You know, we have Wahrheit and Gewissheit. And you rarely get both of them at the same time, although you're always striving to have both of them at the same time. You start out with certainty, you try to get, you know, the greater truth that that fits into. And then the parts don't all map onto each other, and you figure that out. Now you've got the truth, but you've lost the certainty over here. Sometimes we're fortunate enough to come to a, a close where we have both of them at the same time. We almost wind up with the opposite of that in, in the form that spirit is taking here, conscious of itself as pure culture. So he tells us, looking at each of these, right? On the contrary, all the moments become inverted. They become turned on their heads, you might say, or uh, turned around. Um, each changes into the other, and each is the opposite of itself. This is two different things, but they're being subsumed into this dialectic. Each is the opposite of itself. Each gets turned into the other. And if you think this through, how can something both be turned into its other and be the opposite of itself at the same time? It's almost as if it's, there's two different kinds of negation going on here that yield us yet a different relation between the opposite of itself and the, uh, you might say, alienation of itself. Very interesting. Hegel doesn't, doesn't work this out any further at this point, but that's worth keeping in mind. So then he turns to talking about each of these in turn. So he talks about the universal power, which is the substance when it acquires a spiritual nature of its own through the principle of individuality, receives its own self merely as a name, though it is the actuality of power. What was this? This was the unlimited monarch of state power. It turns out to be really the powerless being that sacrifices its own self. What lies behind this, this monarch, and you know, here Hegel is uh, sort of deploying a kind of historical, uh, uh, you know, what would we call it? 
Uh, he's being kind of coy here. Um, it turns out that wealth always is the power behind the throne, at least in modern politics that we've moved into. You know, the king can't be the absolute monarch without the parliament. And when the king pushes too hard, wealth pushes back. Parliament has the ability to tax and to dispense. I, I don't know that we want to go too far with this, but that, that's one thing that would fit what Hegel's talking about. Then he says, this expendable, selfless being or the self that has become a thing is rather the return of that being into itself. It is being for itself that is explicitly for itself the concrete existence of spirit. The individual on the one hand, wealth on the other. Then he says, okay, put that dynamic aside, wealth and state power, what we started this whole section with. What next? The thoughts... So now we've moved now from actuality, Wirklichkeit, into thought. The thoughts of these two essences, of good and bad, become inverted, he says, turned around. What is characterized as good is bad, and vice versa. How do we know this to be the case? We've seen it play itself out throughout this section, but we also know that nothing that truly is billed as good ever turns out to encompass goodness as such. There's always, a, as they say, a fly in the ointment or a worm in the apple. There's badness involved in it. And often, as things proceed on, we find the good turning into the bad. What may be good at one point in time becomes bad through the processes of social change or vice versa. What was bad eventually, in some respect, becomes lauded as good, recognized by consciousness as such. Then he says the consciousnesses of each of these moments, the consciousness is judged as noble and ignoble. The same thing applies to them. Uh, he says they're just the reverse of what these characterizations are supposed to be. The noble consciousness is ignoble and repudiated. The repudiated consciousness tr changes round into nobility, which characterizes the most highly developed freedom of self-consciousness. Here, something different is happening. So the noble consciousness got revealed at several points as not being quite so noble as it, it pretends to be. Even before we got to the flattery and, and we had the service of flattery and then later on base flattery, this use of language, we already saw that there was something for itself that the noble consciousness in its service to the state power was reserving for itself. It became the vassal who had its own you know, game going on on its own demenses and wouldn't quite give everything up. That's why the state power corrals them in at the court and compels them to be sort of satellites around uh, it within a system. So the noble consciousness isn't as noble as it claims to be. As a matter of fact, it turns out that, as Hegel said earlier, the distinction between noble and ignoble consciousness winds up being effaced. And once we bring wealth into the picture, it gets even trickier, right? The noble consciousness has to take stuff from wealth, but when you're bought, uh, the person who's buying you seems to think that they own you, and you're placed in a one-down position as the uh, one who is benefited from the benefactor. What about the ignoble consciousness? The ignoble consciousness really hasn't gotten to talk very much throughout this entire dialectic in this section. Here, again, let me read what Hegel wrote us. The repudiated consciousness changes round into the nobility, which characterizes the most highly developed freedom of self-consciousness. What is this most highly developed freedom? That's going to come uh, a little bit later. So let's look at what's happening in the second part of this paragraph. Hegel now talks about things, he says, from a formal standpoint. He says, everything is outwardly the reverse of <clears throat> what it is for itself.
every one of these is for itself. And yet each one of them, by being for itself, <clears throat> has a loss of itself and has an alienation from itself, a becoming other, a becoming different and distant, you might say, from itself. Now notice what he calls this here. He says, what we have here is that all the moments execute a universal justice on one another. Isn't that an interesting way to talk? Each one of them is executing justice on one another. How so? Each of them is revealing what it is that the other really is. It's showing it up. It's unmasking it. It's telling us, the other consciousness, looking on what these things are for themselves as they'd like to present themselves and thereby what they really are in themselves. The in itself and the for itself is not reconciled here in any of these. So he says, um, true spirit is the unity of these absolutely separate moments. True spirit <clears throat> is the unity of all of these. How can that be the case? This is where we're going to get back to the ignoble consciousness. So he says, it is through the free actuality, these selfless extremes, that as their middle term, it achieves a concrete existence. Spirit takes on concrete existence, takes on flesh, takes on individuality, exists in the world. So what does it exist in? He says it exists in the universal talk, the Sprechen, talking back and forth. And Hegel's going to use cognates now of, of Sprechen, you know, like, like to express, Aussprechen, right, throughout the rest of this. It exists in the universal talk and the destructive judgment, which strips of their significance all those moments which are supposed to count as the true being and as actual members of the whole, now here you might get a little excited with Miller's translation, but we have to be a little bit careful. Hegel does not actually use the term nihilism or nihilistic here. Um, there were some people in, in Kant's time already, in Fichte's time, who were using it. Jacobi famously used that word as a criticism of the Kantian and really by extension all of the German idealistic philosophy. But it, it didn't really didn't have a, a wide currency. And Miller is stretching it here a little bit because the, the word that's being used here is, is you know, uh, cognitive Aufhebung, right? So sublation, something is being uh, nullified, right? Um, so he says, uh, it, you know, it's this game that it plays with itself. <clears throat> so this judging and talking is therefore what is true. The true in true spirit is its use of language and its use of judgment, urteil. Now who is carrying this out? Is it some other person outside of this entire dynamic? It's actually the ignoble consciousness. This is where it, it comes on the scene and asserts itself as where the development is continuing to take place. Let's go back now a little bit. Changes round into the nobility, which characterizes it as the most highly developed freedom of self-consciousness. That's what spirit is bringing to this. So he says it's solely with this alone that one has to, truly to do in this actual world. In this world the world of pure culture, not pure culture in the sense of culture uh, uh, deracinated and you know, stored away on bookshelves or something like that, culture as it's actually being lived, thought out, worked through, consumed. In this world, he says, the spirit of each part finds expression. How so? It's wittily talked about and find said about it what it is. Each of these finds somebody providing it with its own truth. State power doesn't really know what it is. It, it likes to think of itself in a certain way, but it's in the coffee shops, which sometimes they try to close, that the king or the nobility discover who they really are. It's in the broadsheets. 
Likewise, wealth. Wealth doesn't truly know what it is. The people who are wealthy don't truly understand who they are. The noble consciousness. Perhaps even a large portion of the base consciousness. The person who's a peasant. The person who's a worker. The person who is a bastard, an orphan, doesn't realize that they have a larger role to play if they're allowed their moment on the scene, if spirit works through them. So again, he says... The honest individual takes each moment to be an abiding essentiality and it is the uneducated thoughtlessness of not knowing that it is equally doing the reverse. The honest individual is a dupe at this point, doesn't fully understand the way the world, the actuality works. The honest individual expects things to go according to how they used to be talked about or how they're simplistically talked about, not how they are wittily talked about. The disrupted consciousness, he says, however, is consciousness of the perversion and moreover of the absolute perversion. What prevails in it is the notion which brings together in a unity the thoughts which in the honest individual lie far apart. The the honest individual suffers from, uh, you might say, separated categories that can't be bridged into each other. But the other consciousness... The disrupted consciousness has a language that is clever and witty, which can connect these things together. And thereby, even though it seems like it's just kind of, you know, BSing, you know, uh, as we say, shooting the breeze, it's actually revealing the truth of all of these important moments within culture. The content of what spirit says about itself is thus the perversion of every notion and reality, the universal deception of itself and others. And the shamelessness which gives utterance to this deception is just for that reason the greatest truth. This kind of talk is the madness of the musician who heaped up and mixed together 30 arias, Italian, French, tragic, comic, of every sort. Now with a deep bass, he descended into hell. Then contracting his throat, he rends the vaults of heaven with a falsetto tone, frantic and soothed, imperious and mocking by turns. To the tranquil consciousness, which in its honest way takes the melody of the good and the true to consist in the evenness of the notes, that is, in unison, this talk appears as a rigmarole of wisdom and folly, as a medley of as much skill as baseness, of as many correct as false ideas a mixture compounded of a complete perversion of sentiment, of absolute shamelessness, and of perfect frankness and truth. It will be unable to refrain from entering into all these tones and running up and down the entire scale of feelings from the profoundest contempt and dejection to the highest pitch of admiration and emotion. But blended with the latter will be a tinge of ridicule which spoils them. The former, however, will find in their very frankness a strain of reconciliation will find in their subversive depths the all-powerful note which restores spirit to itself. Here in paragraph 522, we're treated to something that we don't often come across in Hegel's phenomenology, and that is not just an allusion or a brief mention, but actual quotation of some text. In this case... It is of Dennis Diderot's, uh, Ramos' nephew. Uh, if you haven't read Diderot, he's really a very interesting author. Um, he is writing, you know, in the time of the, the French monarchy. He's one of the encyclopedists whose work is ultimately going to lead to not just the the French Revolution in general, but also to the greater enlightenment that is taking place. And Diderot was somebody who really had quite a good comic sense, as well as being quite a serious guy in many other respects. Um, Interestingly, my my favorite work by him is one that's equally uh, interesting. It's called Jacques le Fataliste et son maître, you know, Jacques the Fatalist and his master, um, which is a picaresque novel. The Rommel's nephew is a little bit more biting, uh, it's, it's about these, you might call them parasitical, uh, people who are, are sort of trying to figure out where they, 
they fit into society. And, and, you know, when that sort of thing is on the scene, that's a sign that there's something wrong, something not really worked out, but something dynamic within that society. We might think of many other great works of literature. If you haven't read Diderot, I would say that if you wanted to pick somebody who would be kind of a contemporary uh, in, in doing this, you could think of somebody like Tom Wolfe, perhaps. Um, others might have other great suggestions as well. So Hegel tells us that the content of what spirit says about itself, saying it through the ignoble consciousness, is thus the, he's going to say three things, the perversion, the verkehrung of every notion, every begriff, and reality, realität in this case, the universal deception, betrug, of, one, of itself and of others. And here's where it gets really interesting. Here's where the truth of spirit, true spirit, is coming on the scene through language. The shamelessness which gives utterance to this deception is just for that reason the greatest truth. This shamelessness expresses this deception. It doesn't just enact the deception. It also unveils the fact that deception is taking place. This is going to lead ultimately to what Hegel's calling a frankness, an orphanheit, being open about things. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? It is a good thing in a sense, but it's also, you might say, for many people, something terrible because it's the sign that nothing truly is what it pretends to be. Everything is susceptible to being unmasked. Now, that's not where Hegel's going with this. Instead, he talks about a proliferation, a profusion of different content. So here's where he starts quoting Diderot. So this kind of talk is the madness of the musician who, here is the line, heaped up and mixed together 30 arias, Italian, French, tragic comic of every sort. So he's taking all of these different, what should be distinct genres of things. What in the, just, in the last passage we talked about, wealth, state power, the noble consciousness, the ignoble consciousness, good, bad, mixing them all up together. Producing a composite picture, you might say. Then Hegel says, Now with a deep bass he descended into hell, then contracting his throat, he rent the vaults of heaven with a falsetto tone, frantic and soothed, imperious and mocking by turns. This is a virtuoso, a virtuoso of imitation. A virtuoso who is able to take bits and pieces of what it is that others have taken seriously and done for their own sake. You know, it's interesting. This is a bit of a, a digression here. There is a lot of people that throw around the word postmodern uh, basically as a slur word today, I think without really recognizing what's meant by it. And, and I'm not going to go into a long thing about the different types of postmodern. You can read Jameson and his wonderful analysis in, in his work on the postmodern uh, for that. Um, suffice it to say that the kind of pastiche, that uh, the, uh, the ironic detachment that is often seen as the hallmark of the aesthetic postmodern, that's already here being described and discussed by Hegel, who's gotten it from Diderot, who's not just making it up himself, but getting it from the culture that he inhabits in the very heart of the modern and not even the late modern. So this is actually kind of an important point here. So, Again, Hegel brings up the tranquil consciousness in its honest way, which wants the melody of the good and the true to consist in the evenness of the notes. Some sort of comprehensive, you know, just, just if you're going to play jazz, just play jazz. Don't mix it together with country or funk or folk or whatever it happens to be, right? Let alone world music. 
Just play the, the pure thing so I know what we're doing here, it might be saying. He says, this talk appears... Now, who's he talking about? Is the talk uh, the talk of the singer? No, the talk now is the talk of the ignoble consciousness. This talk, he says, appears as a rigmarole of wisdom and folly, as a medley of as much skill as baseness, of as many correct as false ideas, a mixture compounded of a complete perversion of sentiment, of absolute shamelessness and perfect frankness and truth. Once again, we see these three themes turning up, don't we? It will be unable to refrain from entering into all these tones and running up and down the entire range of scale of feelings from their profoundest contempt and dejection to the highest pitch of admiration and and emotion. But blended with the latter, notice, will be a tinge of ridicule which spoils them. So again, we've got a virtuoso. Now a virtuoso, you might say, of the life of the heart and of the mind. But with a sort of ironic detachment. They can take on whatever emotional comportment seems needed or perhaps interesting or perhaps amusing in the situation. But they do so without fully committing to it. You might say, well, this is the opposite of truth. Hegel says this is the truth of culture at this point. So this is an openness, a frankness, a being willing to call things what they are, to show them for what they are, as not being what they pretend to be, what they are pretended to be by those who identify with them. Again, the postmodern, present here already, in culture, not at the end of Hegel's discourse, but right in the middle of it. So he goes on and he says, the former, who is the former? The former is the person who can see their way through this. will find in their very frankness a strain of reconciliation. Reconciliation, the opposite of alienation. will find in their subver- subversive deaths the all-powerful note which restores spirit to itself. This is not the end. This is not a resting place. But this is a forward movement in the eyes of Hegel. 